Революція гідності стала першою і головне виграшною битвою у війні за нашу незалежність. This is Olena Rybak, the wife of Horlivka politician Volodymyr Rybak, who was tortured and killed by murderers in East Ukraine. Her life was shattered when the body of her husband was found in a river with his stomach ripped open. Last year he planted 39 trees. He planted them carefully and made sure he did a thorough job. One of our neighbors told me, I was surprised to see Volodya come to every tree and touch each one. Only later on did it occur to me that he was saying goodbye to them. I came to realize how resigned he had become. Towards the end, he often thanked me and said I was the only one who supported him. We were living in difficult times. Olena's life has been changed forever by the horror of her husband's murder. For the past year, she has spoken of little else. She talks about his patriotism and how his death helped pro-Russian forces in Horlivka. This was especially evident once the town fell to Russian-backed militants. Everybody understood that this man could not be broken. He was a strong-willed and very capable man. He planned to defend the city and keep it Ukrainian. He had the willpower to do it. But in order to defeat an army, you just need to kill the general. It's very simple, and it should be done in such a brutal way that nobody else would ever dare to resist. That's exactly what they did. Olena recounts how her husband, Volodymyr, removed Russian flags from government buildings in the city with his own hands and called on the locals to resist the separatists. On the day of his abduction, he had attempted to return the Ukrainian national flag to its place on the local administration building. Here he's trying to enter, but they won't let him. He wanted to do it himself, because nobody except him would do it. Until half past three, he had been moving across the city, trying to mobilize pro-Ukrainian activists. Until the last minute, he believed that the mayor would change his mind and declare the city Ukrainian. He believed a resistance movement would emerge. Until four o'clock, he was at the rally. At six, I started to worry and called him. The first call was rejected. When I called again, his phone was no longer connected. I think by then he was already being abducted. On April 17, 2014, Volodymyr disappeared. Ever since then, Olena has been working to make the local Horlivka authorities of the time face justice. She holds them directly responsible for the failure to protect her husband or secure his release. The order not to help in the search for my husband came from above. I don't exactly know who gave the order, whether it was local or regional authorities, but I have no doubt that the order was issued. Criminal structures were closely tied to the local authorities and the police. He managed to upset everyone, and so they decided to deal with him. Five days later, two mutilated bodies were discovered in the Torets River, close to the town of Slavyansk. One of them was Volodymyr Rybak. The other was a young Maidan activist. Olena traveled to militant-occupied Slavyansk to identify her husband's body. The first thing I wanted after all this was revenge. I want to ask the militants who are fighting for the independence of Donetsk, why did you kill my husband? He was unarmed. All he had was his convictions. He supported Ukrainian unity. A witness later emerged who had managed to escape.
He was the last to see my husband alive. He told me. I heard a whisper. I looked around and saw that Rybak was praying. He asked God to give him the strength not to break down. Then he was taken to the 11th floor, where they had installed a torture chamber in the 21st century. My husband was taken there, and nobody saw him anymore. But according to the damage done to his body, they tortured him for a long time. But failed to get the information they wanted from him. They couldn't break him. Olena continues to call for a fair and open investigation into her husband's murder. She claims the Ukrainian security services know the identities of the killers, who are still free to commit further crimes. It's total lawlessness. It took three months to open any kind of criminal investigation into the killing. One month ago, I visited investigators together with the mother of the boy killed alongside my husband and asked what progress they had made. They told me they knew who the killers and torturers were. Some are no longer alive. Some are in occupied Donetsk. Others have gone to Russia. I asked when they would be brought to justice. They said they didn't know and told me to wait. How long should I wait? Nobody could answer me. And so the conversation continued. Officially, more than one and a half thousand Ukrainian soldiers are registered as missing as a result of the conflict. There are no figures available for the number of civilians missing or abducted by militants. Many people have lost hope in the future. They're on the verge of psychological breakdown and don't know what to do. Nobody can support themselves or find work. There's no way back to the way things were before. For some, it's due to their pro-Ukrainian position. For others, it's the fact that their home has been destroyed. Everyone has their problems, their own reasons. Only hope in a better future keeps me going. Maidan showed us that the authorities must take the wishes of the population into consideration. I believe that we will succeed in building a democratic country and move towards the European Union. The process won't be fast, but it's already underway. I've never contemplated leaving Ukraine. The thought never entered my mind. I asked my children where they would like to grow up, and they said they didn't want to leave the country. My daughter told me she only wants to live in Ukraine. She told me, I think everything in Ukraine is going to be okay. Olena accepted the Hero of Ukraine order, which was awarded posthumously to her husband. Volodymyr Rybak was named a Hero of Ukraine along with activists killed during Ukraine's Euromaidan protests in early 2014. At 8 or 8.30, they began banging on the door. Hello, we're from the Donetsk People's Republic. We want to talk to you. And I understood that this was the end. Anna was kidnapped from her apartment in May 2014. 
She spent six days imprisoned in the basement of the security services building in Makievka directorate for combating organized crime, Ubop. It's not good when a girl swears, but my only thought was, I'm so young, and this is the end. They blindfolded Anna with a strip of this flag hanging on the wall of the room. My grandfather taught me about history, and I have enough imagination to have an idea what the Stalin era and KVD was like. And here I was with seven big guys who said to me, you are our enemy. They were clearly in a theatrical mood and tore up my Ukrainian flag to make a blindfold for putting me into a car. The mood was reminiscent of a low-budget gangster movie full of cheap bravado. They promised to kill me during the journey. Anna had been an active participant in Euromaidan protests in Donetsk. She had no idea that in the 21st century you could lose your life for displaying your national flag and for expressing support for democracy. I was taken before a man in uniform who was in the role of an executioner. He was highly agitated and began to hurl abuse and accusations at me. I'll make you eat your flag. Were you in Odessa? Women there are in hysterics. I began to wonder whether I would ever wake up from this nightmare. Along the militants were some women who Anna took to be administrative members of staff from the local security services. They regarded Anna as a traitor. One of them slapped her across the face. They used a hunting knife to scare me. If they really wanted to kill me, we would not be talking. I think the knife was designed to intimidate me, but I still had to protect myself. Nevertheless, I received some cuts. I had no way of knowing his intentions. The knife itself was real enough. She was beaten and cut with a knife. Her captors tried to make her confess involvement in the nationalist group Right Sector, but she remained silent. They ordered me to write, I love Donbass in my blood, or they would shoot me. This was not a problem, as I do genuinely love the Donbass. I wrote the sentence and asked them whether to end with a full stop or an exclamation mark. Anna was condemned to death for treason against Donetsk People's Republic. This was the first day of the battle for the Donetsk airport. Trucks carrying dead and wounded militants began arriving, and the sight of so much blood drove my captors crazy. They became savages. I can't justify it, but would like to know how people can become so inhuman. The pack mentality made them become even wilder, and they began calling on each other to tear their enemies limb from limb. The situation was clearly becoming critical. I moved into the corner and began to pray. They threatened to slit my throat. At that moment, if you'd asked me how I felt, I could honestly answer that I wasn't scared. I was still in Donetsk. I had already taken part in pro-Ukrainian rallies on many occasions when I knew that I could be killed. Why should I be scared now? But I was conscious of the fact that my life could be over at any moment. At that point, I understood that my life was unfulfilled, and I had been making excuses to myself without realizing my full potential. All those excuses about self-realization would die with me. Anna got lucky. On the 4th of June, she was exchanged for militant prisoners. Others were not so fortunate. On the 5th of June, a video appeared on the internet showing militant leaders executing prisoners on camera and issuing ultimatums. So they let me live, although I don't know why. After I survived, my only concern was to try and save more lives. So many of us are still searching for answers to simple questions. Girls from Lviv, Poltava and Crimea, as well as separatist women, all ask the same question. What is the point of this bloody theater? It's obvious that everything was well planned in advance. Everything was designed to play on human emotions and to exploit divisions and conflicts of interest. We just want to know how long this will last. 
What will remain of the Donbass? How many of us will survive? What's the point of it all? Now, Anna lives in Kyiv at a friend's apartment. Her mother and daughter are living in a temporary camp for refugees. Her father remains in the Donetsk region, living in occupied territory. Anna has not lost her faith in humanity. She brings together Donetsk women and arranges poetry readings for them in Kyiv. They threaten us with nuclear weapons and aircraft, but we're just girls. We don't want any revolutions. That's the truth. Quite a lot of reforms have been adopted as a result of the events in 2013 and 2014. Now we just want peace. Now it's important to show that ordinary women like us who want peace are everywhere. I warn Uncle Putin to be careful because Ukrainian women like us can be found all over the globe. If Ukrainian women throughout the world could unite, the war would be over within a week. My name is Alona, I'm from Donetsk. My mother was abducted and held prisoner. Olga Klimenko was taken captive in Donetsk on May the 24th, 2014, on the eve of Ukraine's presidential election. Olga was a member of the local election commission and was carrying ballots to her polling station. They were stopped by the police. When they started to search the car, they saw the ballots. Of course, they informed the Donetsk militants, who soon arrived and surrounded my mother. Passerbys were prevented from filming the incident. My mother immediately called my father. He came but was only able to memorize the car license plates. Backed by law enforcement officers who had defected to the side of the separatists, militants abducted Olga, placed a bag over her head and took her to an unknown destination. She did not know where she was being taken. They blindfolded her. We didn't know where they would take her either. My father just saw her being driven away. Later we learned from my mother that they had taken her to the regional security service building, which was occupied by the militants. But at the time when we tried to find her, the militant leader, Hushlin, told us that she was being held at the regional administration building. He assured us she was okay and would be freed after the elections. For six days, her family tried to secure Olga's freedom by any means possible, even offering to pay a ransom. Throughout the following six days, we spent our time trying to get in touch and to find out where my mother was being held. We could not make the contact with her and had no idea whether she was dead or alive. Aliona first learned that her mother had been tortured via messages posted on social media. After her release, Olga did not speak for several days. For three days she was not given any food. She was beaten and subjected to mock executions. When I finally saw her, she was pale and exhausted. It's devastating to see any human in such a state. What can someone look like after being held for six days in such conditions, in a cold basement? She was barely recognizable. When her captors had learned that she had a son and that he had not volunteered for the Donetsk militants, she was sentenced to death by firing squad. She was brought out and forced to stand in front of a firing squad, but they fired blanks. She was subjected to a second mock execution when they learned that she was an ethnic Russian. They accused her of betraying her country. This time they fired real bullets over her head and forced her to play Russian roulette. I only learned about this later. It was pure luck that she survived. Thankfully, my mother was lucky. Immediately after the kidnapping of her mother, Aliona's father took her to Slavyansk, where she remains to this day. I'd never seen my dad cry before. He just called me and cried. We couldn't do anything. We were in a state of shock. I cannot express in words how it feels when you do not know where your loved ones are and whether they're still alive. 
Olga's captors tried to force her to provide the names of others who did not support the separatist movement. She's a very strong woman. I discovered this for myself. When I learned how she had remained strong throughout her captivity and refused to give in to her interrogators, she said she stayed silent not because she didn't want to say anything, but because she couldn't speak. Before all this started, she had helped free people from captivity. She knew how the militants treated their prisoners and said to me, they will kill me, so why should I tell them anything? But somehow she was fortunate. On the other hand, I understand that the hate is so strong that she has to do something. That's why she continues to do this dangerous work. Olga was eventually released as a part of a prisoner exchange. The reunited family left Donetsk. However, following her experience in captivity, Olga no longer felt able to lead an ordinary civilian life. Instead, she volunteered to serve in the Ukrainian army. She simply called me and said, I'm joining the IDAR battalion. I'll be passing through Slavyansk. I said, don't just pass by, take me with you. But she had already made her decision. She told me, I'm needed there. At the front, they need more people and more help. She has been with the IDAR battalion since October or November. I've seen her just once this year. This Saturday, I'll go to see her again. Alyona still lives in the liberated town of Slavyansk, but she regularly risks her freedom in order to visit her mother in the frontline town of Shchastya. She's my mother. It would be better if I was an actress depicting someone else's life. I could hide behind the scenes and resurrect myself a hundred times. I could keep everything under wraps and behind a black veil. I could be beautiful and nasty at the same time. And I would not feel sorry for myself. Olga is not an actress. She is a volunteer. She took part in Ukraine's Maidan protests and stayed on as an activist at Kyiv's Ukraine house. She helps to prepare soldiers heading for the front lines and greets them upon their return. The shadow left by Maidan, that's our barricade. The guys who leave say at the last moment, I'll be back. Please wait for me. I'll definitely be back. So I tell them, yes, I'll be waiting. Every day, this could happen with several guys. I look forward to seeing them. I would love to see this end soon, but I understand that it will last for a long time. Olga's 21-year-old son, Vlad, is one of the many to go missing during the undeclared war in East Ukraine. He has been missing for eight months. He's left. It was at the end of May, the beginning of July. For three weeks, I did not know where he was. For three weeks. Since 2010, Vlad had run a group in the East Ukrainian town of Horlivka, battling against AIDS and drug addiction. He also loved to take part in regional kayaking competitions. Every year he goes kayaking. Mom, I'm kayaking, he'd say. Kayaking is good, but it's difficult to stay in touch. This time, I started to worry. At least, could you tell me where you're going? In the Volnavacha region. Later, Olga learned that her son had volunteered to go to war. I received a final text message. He told me, Mom, it's okay. If something happens to me, you'll be the first to know. 
But on July 21st, at around 11 p.m., I received a new message from Lodic, which read, Pray for us, there are just a few hours left. That was all. Olga learned that her son, who had volunteered to defend his country, was lost. This terrible understanding that you may never learn the truth. Nobody would tell me the truth. Some said our forces were in the area. Others, that they had withdrawn. Then it turned out that they were never there at all. They were volunteers, and so no formal records were kept. I was left with silence. Some guys went to the front directly from Maidan. They went without their passports or anything else. They simply disappeared. Maidan continued. The Kiev barricades have moved to the east. It was horrible when I received such calls. I would pick up the phone and there would be silence or they would hang up. I would immediately call back and receive the message. The number you have dialed is not in service. Calls would often come at 5 a.m. And it always gave me hope that my son had simply been unable to reach me, but I did not know. For weeks, Olga could not eat or drink. She was consumed with uncertainty. At first, I would draw horrible pictures, especially after watching the news on TV and seeing how the Donbass was being taken over. So much torture and pain, cellars and basements. People being cut up because they have patriotic Ukrainian tattoos. And everything builds up inside. You hide yourself and cut yourself off from the world. Ukrainian military officials cannot help Olga. On the contrary, their requests and questions frequently brought him more heartache. Hello, we are from the security service of Ukraine. Please confirm if your son is in captivity. I replied in disbelief at the question. They promised to call back in 15 minutes. During those 15 minutes, you can go crazy wondering what they will tell you. Then they called back and simply said, we are updating the lists of prisoners. Three or four months passed. From day to day, the same things, the same questions. One fine day, they called me and asked, do you agree to officially declare your son as a missing person? I'm sorry, but this time I cursed. I do not need anything from you, nothing. Just leave me alone and stop calling. All through this time, I would remember the little things from our life that I might normally have forgotten about. I came to know him as a man and as a human being rather than a son. All his habits, everything. I think I learned more about my child during this time than when we were together. But one conversation with a Maidan friend, who had returned from the conflict zone, gave her the strength to continue waiting for as long as it takes, maybe even to the end of her life. One good man, a military man, said, to, until you see for yourself that your son is dead, don't believe anybody or any documents you may be shown. Don't believe it. If you do not have a sense that he's gone, it means that he's still alive. He will return. It helps me so much and it gives me the strength to continue to volunteer as an activist in Kiev and help people here. I want to have a granddaughter. I have wanted a granddaughter I even bought expensive earrings for her. There is nothing left in Horlivka, no home and no earrings for my granddaughter. 
but I think I'll buy some more because I'm convinced I will have a granddaughter. That is what I want.